Uh, hi, uh, I, my name's Kyle. Um, I work on a site called NeoCities. Um, I'm not going to talk too much specifically about what NeoCities does tonight. Um, it's a web hosting service, essentially. Um, the idea is to try to bring back the original idea of people making sites, not just for like business purposes, but for like you know fun and creative expression purposes. Um, you know, a lot of people use us for business sites too, because um, actually for the following reason. Um, so Ben, uh, Ben's been trying to get me to do a talk here for months, and I'm, I'm either like out of town or busy or something. And um, you know, part of it, what I keep telling Ben is I'm like Ben, I don't actually use no, I don't actually use Node.js for a lot of stuff. Like I I just don't. And um, there actually is a little, there's like a little proxy. It's one of those like miracle programs I had to like whip together to like put some random thing into another thing, and I like you know threw in 30 lines of code and just like put it in a screen and ran it, and it's been like running for three months straight with no bugs for some reason, even though I just like whipped it together in five minutes. But um, so I didn't really know what to talk about here, um, and 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 he and Ben was just like, all right, well, just talk about whatever you think is important, that whatever you want to share with people, whatever you want people to know, the thing that's like driving you crazy right now or the thing that you're really inspired by. And um, because I'm more Gen Xer than Millennial, I'm going to tell you about the thing that's driving me crazy right now instead uh, of the thing that I'm optimistic about in the future. Um, but I am optimistic about uh, this changing in the future. And the way that I'm trying to change it is to make people aware of it. And it is a very big problem. It's something I had to learn as a consequence of working on NeoCities and, um, you know, so quick disclaimers, uh, I'm going to rag on a bunch of cloud services. Uh, if you use those cloud services, I'm not personally judging you. I don't care. Um, you know, don't worry about it. If you work for those cloud services, again, don't take it personally. I don't care. I'm just, I mean, I don't care that you work for them. But like, anyway, this is my big thing that I'm trying to get people to think about because nobody's thinking about it right now. Um, and it's a big problem for me because it makes it harder for me to run NeoCities as a consequence. So let's get to it. Uh, the TLDR of this talk, before you tune out uh, and, and just don't pay attention to it, uh, cloud is cheap in and expensive out. That's the fundamental business model of most of the cloud services. And as a consequence, um, the biggest problem and why we can't use cloud for anything is because they charge almost nothing to get your data in. They charge almost nothing for you to store your data there. And they charge a shit ton of money to get your, your data out. And this is, you know, if you're now, if you're not doing anything with a lot of bandwidth, you know, whatever, right? Like I've worked for most of my career, I worked on corporate apps that maybe use less than 10 gigabytes of traffic ever. And, 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 and it's stuff that you'd like try to throw together and then hopefully never touch again or make a few changes here and there. And if that's what you're working on, by all means, use the cloud. It's perfect for it. You know, if you don't need a lot of bandwidth, if you don't need a ton of infrastructure stuff, it's totally fine. Go for it. But the fundamental change that the internet is seeing right now, uh, for better and mostly worse, <laughs> is that, and, and Neocities is a part of this, we're going from a crea creative and information-oriented internet into a consumption-oriented internet right now. Like, that's the main transition that's happening right now. And, and a lot of the reason for that is that we now have the, in we don't have the infrastructure capacities to do things like video streaming and video on demand and things like this. And if you look at the numbers, 71% of millennials don't look, watch TV anymore. And so, you know, the idea is that in the next 30 years, pretty much all television, all media, all visual and audio content will go through the internet. And um, when you are working on that model, you, it requires a lot of bandwidth. And when you need a lot of bandwidth, you need to be able to pay the market rates for that and not be, you know, not pay crazy rates for that because you can't, it's a margins business. You're building a factory, you know, like a corporate app's like a boutique thing. This is a factory. You're building something for mass consumption. Um, and, you know, NeoCities, though I sort of emphasize that it's like a creative endeavor and project, and I love all the stuff that comes out of it, it is fundamentally a factory business. You know, like we have to ship a lot of data. And, um, and so that's, you know, bandwidth is more important to us than the ability to fire up virtual machines on demand, you know. So, all right. <laughs> Uh, what I'm going to attempt to do is, ask, is, is demonstrate to you just how badly, just how much higher they charge for bandwidth than everyone else does. And um, that's, you know, then you can have that in your head. So then in the future, if you ever have to do something bandwidth intensive, you know the difference and you can plan for that. Um, and yeah, so. <clears throat> 
if you dig into uh, their uh, Amazon Web Services and Google Cloud are going to be the two particular examples. There's like dozens of them. I could go through all of them. I'm not going to. Um, but Amazon Web Services charges uh, nine cents per gigabyte for egress traffic. That's any data that's leaving their network. They charge you know for every gigabyte you send out, it's nine cents. Um, Google Cloud is a little different. Um, they charge sort of variably between nine and I think twenty cents was the number. It's kind of hard to figure out the exact numbers sometimes because they just there's just it's so it's so unstru there's just like calculators right. Um, there is like a cloud, there's like a context of a CDN, so you can like throw stuff in front of like, uh, AWS can have this thing called CloudFront, and then like it has different rates and stuff like that, but they're more or less like, you know, within the ballpark of like 5 to 15 to 28 cents sometimes even. Yeah, Fastly, that was the Fastly one. Uh, when they go over to Asia, they start charging a lot more, and actually it does cost more over there for transit. I mean, that, that is true, but um, anyway. Right now, I'm paying. This is my this is my rates right now for NeoCities. I'm paying between 0 .00125 uh, dollars. Is that even? It's like a fraction of a penny per gigabyte to one cent per gigabyte, which is like the high-level CDN thing that we have a lot of data centers running in AnyCast network on. Um, you know, that's somewhere between. Well, it's a lot now. That doesn't sound like a lot, right? It's like, oh, what, what, eight cents? What's the difference? You know, whatever. That's not that big of a deal. Well, um, this is uh, this is Mr. Dube's site on NeoCities, and uh, Mr. Dube is—I don't actually know his real name. Richard something. Uh, he's this—he's the uh, creator of uh, 3JS, or the maintainer. Or I'm not one of the two. I don't exactly know. He's awesome, um, and he throws all his examples up on NeoCities, and he has just a bunch of these like crazy 3D things that like are generated with JavaScript, and you can click on them and loads them in a browser, and you can like edit them and stuff. It's pretty cool. Um, this is one of the busiest sites on NeoCities. It actually pulls in routinely between like two and five terabytes of traffic a month, uh, just for the site, um, and. Last time I ran a number on this, I think it was at like two or three terabytes when, it, when I ran this estimate. Um, if I was to post this site, if I had NeoCities running on top of Amazon Web Services and I was hosting this site, um, I calculated that it would cost me, including like the sort of like per HTTP request hits and stuff, it would cost me about $560 a month to host this guy's site on NeoCities. Um, to give you a contrast on this, uh, I spend less than $5 on the transit to actually serve this right now. And so when I talk about like, well, this isn't, you know, what's the big deal? The big deal, the difference is between being able to host this site and I literally have zero problem with hosting it and having to be like, hey, Mr. Do, get, get your shit off Neo said he's like, you're bankrupting us, you know, like, because we don't actually make a lot of money either. So that's a $560 a month is a lot for us, you know. Um, so I want to show you this chart. This is this guy, drpeering.net is this sort of weird long blog for people to do IP transit and bandwidth stuff, and sort of just shows um, the trend of bandwidth costs since 1998 to 2015. And as you can see, it's just absolutely collapsing right now. Um, it started at $1,200, and now it's under a dollar per megabit. Now, this is a little bit different than like the per, you know, paying per gigabyte model, uh, and that's part of the reason that's part of the thing that makes all the bandwidth stuff confusing. It's um, in classic IP, so IP transit is when you buy like an, it's basically an internet connection, right? It's just like a fancy way of saying an internet connection and you connect it to your servers and they just hook up a hose basically, right? And they don't like meter it for like usage usually, they just sort of like, okay, here's a gigabit connection, like here's one, you know, 1,000 megabits and you can shoot as much crap through it as you can and we'll just, you charge, you, we charge you for the connection basically and then we don't care how much you actually send through it. Um, and so, you know, on that model, then you are get charged per gigabit. And these numbers vary depending on how much you transit you order. So, for example, this is for like one gigabit, but if you order like 10 gigabits, then it's cheaper and that sort of model. But then, of course, you're spending a lot more for it because it's a lot more transit. Um, okay. So, right now, as of 2015, uh, 0.63 63 per megabits. Now, that obviously doesn't, how do we compare that to gigabytes, right? Um, well, let's convert it. So. Uh, I think I did the math right here. 100 megabit connection is, you know, if you just like shot, this is like a theoretical number and you got, you, for God's sakes, never run, do this, <laughs> you know, but if you shot exactly the amount of like data you could shoot through that pipe um, consistently for a month, it'd be like 192 terabytes or something like that, which is 192,000 gigabytes if I did the numbers right. Just feel free to interrupt me if I did them wrong. 
Um, <clears throat> so I'm spending right now in a data center in Hillsboro. This is my cheapest one, that cheapest example. I'm spending $240 a month for a gigabit connection to our servers, uh, which is, um, so now I can take 193,000 and that $240, and I can start running comparison numbers. So um, with Amazon Web Services, that would cost, if I actually push that much traffic through, $14,734.14. On Google Cloud, it's a little more expensive. By the way, Google Cloud, I just did North American egress. I didn't do Asia or whatever, because I didn't even know how to figure that out. I mean, like, what's the percentage of the traffic that's going to be from a different country or whatever? I don't know. So that's 15000 And then again, I'm paying between $240 a month and $1,920 a month for the same thing. Or a 61 time to 7 time difference, which is a big number. Um, so when you actually put it on that chart, you get this, which is that NeoCities is like sort of, you know, we're basically following that curve down where we're spending, like, I think it was, what was the number? I'm sorry, I'm going back. I didn't put it down, that's stupid. Okay. I'm sorry. I think it was like 30, like 24 cents per m megabit or something like that. And then um, the cloud was like somewhere between like 12 and 16 dollars or something like that. Um, so what I'm trying to distill here is that when you pay that rate, you're basically paying the same price that people were paying for transit in 2007. And that's, that's a big difference. <laughs> um, I get a lot of, you know, I, I love to bring this up on Hacker News whenever some like weird cloud thing happens and you know, the use case is different. The pre, it's premium bandwidth is the favorite of, for, of people. I always, it's a better bandwidth or whatever, even though it's literally, if you look at the peering model, it's just peered to the same IP transit. I mean, th there is a context of like prioritized bandwidth as a concept, but you know, I've never seen a single documentation, documented instance on any of these cloud services where they actually describe you what you get for that different price. You know, like, oh, it's, it's premium. Like, well, what does that mean? You know, like, you're peering with the same people that everyone else is. Um, uh, the, other, the other wonderful example that the Hacker News people love to do is uh, get, just put it on Cloudflare. It's free. You know, they, you don't have to pay for it if it's on Cloudflare. They will charge you at some point. Like, don't worry about it. Like, if you are using a lot of their traffic, they will send you an email and be like, we need you to pay for us because, you know, this isn't free for us and we need to actually make money. We're a company. Um, you know, premium bandwidth, right? It's It's... It's peered bandwidth. It goes through switches and routers. It's, they all use the same Cisco routers. In fact, they're like, a, if you want to do anything except for Cisco routers, they get confused and they give you weird looks and stuff, and, which we don't, you know, we don't because we can't afford it. It's like really expensive stuff. But um, anyway, uh, you know, I get a lot of, we're using, you know, and then there's all these posts on Hacker News. They're like, well, I've saved a couple, you know, hundred, I've dropped a couple of servers by using Kubernetes or React or, you know, serviceless, serviceless architecture is, a new thing now, and I actually, it's really interesting. I actually like service. Ar I like serverless architecture as a concept. I don't want to have to be like a Linux sysadmin to run a web application. That's a great idea, you know. Like again, just bring down the bandwidth costs, and we'll have a conversation about that. I mean, I, I'm not opposed to that at all. You know, running servers is a pain in the ass. Um, but again, it's just like what what is the? It's all tooling related stuff. It's sort of like the way that like Amazon and Cloud Google have decided to compete with each other is not by competing on bandwidth. Um, it's by competing on tooling, and you know, I've, I've, to be honest, never found either of their tooling to be particularly grand, and it's never been a very convincing argument either way for me. It's just sort of like random things I have to learn. Uh, I'm more interested in cost control than I am in tooling, and I just, again, just nobody talks about it and nobody brings it up. So, you know, I talked about the factory model earlier. Um, if you're building a factory company, if you need to do web, if you need to do video streaming, if you need to do um, you know, M, you know, M music distribution. If you need to do something that involves an intense amount of bandwidth, you know, please be careful before you go into the cloud stuff. Like, run the numbers, figure out what your costs are actually going to be. Um, there have been a lot of—I'm not going to name names—but there have been a lot of web hosts that uh, I that are run by people that I know that put all of their infrastructure on top of like the cloud services and um, essentially went bankrupt because they couldn't afford the bills, like because they ended up getting enough traffic where they actually couldn't pay to run the, the network anymore. And it, you know, it sound, it's like, well, you can just switch to another provider. Once you get your stuff in, it's very hard to get it out. Like, you know, it's, if you're depending on Amazon S3 for your file storage solution, you know, it's going to be very difficult for you to move that out into something else. It's not a trivial thing, especially when it's a production system. You know, like, you have to do this while you're running in production, and it's very difficult to do, actually. I mean, so be, be aware of that, you know. Uh, 
the main reason I like to bring this up is because it's not just bad for your wallet and it's not just, you know, for the, your expenses at your company. It's not just bad for, you know, I mean, it's, it's actually great for me if like I have like, I don't, we don't have, NeoCities doesn't really have competitors, but I've definitely worked on bandwidth intensive sites that have had competitors before and, you know, it's great for that. I mean, I'm, I don't mind if like, if I ever start a company and competing with somebody and they use this stuff, because it's again, it's just like, well, your costs are gonna be 10 times higher than mine, but whatever, have fun. The reason I'm really concerned about this is, and the reason I keep bringing it up is because I see it as being very dangerous for the internet. Uh, so this guy's, uh, this is an article that came out not too long ago, uh, Jeff Huston. Uh, he's sort of this like Australian wonk like IPv6 guy that works over at APNIC. APNIC is the internet regi IP registry service for Australia, it, like so the Asia Pacific region. So like they assign IP addresses for that area. We have our own and it's called Aaron. And then um, Europe has one, RIPE. And then actually South Africa, or sorry, Africa has AFRINIC, which uh, still has IPv4 addresses. And there's a lot of companies that are trying to pretend to be like Ken based in Kenya so they can get access to them because they're pretty much the only uh, IP address assignment company that has IP addresses anymore. But uh, anyway, this article was about the death of transit. And one of the observations he made was that the combination of like the cost of bandwidth falling, which is that chart I showed you, and the fact that when the, he goes to uh, like sort of conferences related to this stuff, that they're more talking about CDNs and like sort of services baked on top of these infrastructures rather than the actual IP transit itself. And his sort of musing in this article was, you know, is IP transit going to essentially die and then be replaced with a couple of like really, really large CDN services that end up sort of driving um, most of the traffic through them. And essentially they would then become the, the IP transit that we use today. Instead of that, it would be, you know, like Google and, and Amazon and Cloudflare, for example, right? Um, I think it was like somewhere between 10 and 15% of web traffic like already goes through Cloudflare. <laughs> so like it's, it, that's not like, it's not that big of a stretch to sort of imagine that because it's kind of happening uh, already. Um, but you know, there's a, f there's a lot of, well, so yeah, I, I already did this. So this is why I'm a little concerned about this right now. First of all, um, they are centralized gatekeepers. Uh, IP Transit is a disaster. Like the companies suck. They're horrible to deal with. They're a nightmare. I've dealt with them. They suck. But there's a lot of them, and they and, and in some definition of competition, they're competitive with each other. Um, it is a decentralized system. You know, if you have a problem with like a certain type of internet provider, uh, like for example, if I'm using something like Cogent and they screw something up, I can set up, I can configure my routers to redirect traffic automatically through a different IP a, a transit provider. So it is, they are like completely autonomous organizations that essentially peer with each other and then you can peer with them in multi-home and decide where your traffic goes in the event that like things fail and stuff like that. Um, you don't get something like that when you use something like Cloudflare. You get Cloudflare, you know. It is, an, it is a single organizational failure point um, for, yeah. Uh, you get uh, less organizational autonomy. Uh, this is a big problem. Uh, if you start, so there's, if you're just dealing with a lot of bandwidth, like. That's a very different thing than if you're dealing with a lot of bandwidth that involves like hundreds of thousands of other people posting their content to your servers, <laughs> which is what we do. Um, uh, the way that the internet sort of, I mean, this law and just sort of random circumstance has like made this a thing, but the way that the internet sort of defines autonomy as in like, you know, who has actual, how do I describe this? Who has actual, at what point do you define, define the level where this organization has actual autonomy in that they can do anything as long as it's not against the law in the United States, right? And the way that we generally partition that right now is that we partition it on the IP address level. So it's not, so for example, um, if I get a block of IP addresses, which I do, I actually, we actually own an IP address block now. We have one of the last IPv4s on the planet or whatever, you know, like. Um, that is like sort of the, the point where I will get things like uh, phishing reports. Like when I get fish, if you know, every once in a while people post phishing attacks on NeoCities. And we have, we have these sort of like crazy alg AI algorithm things that like detect them and stuff and get rid of them. But every once in a while one slips through and um, you know, we get complaints and they don't complain to our, the people that run the domain. They don't complain to my contact, my nice little contact form on the website. They don't contain, they don't complain to whatever emails written in the who is, who is or whatever. 
Uh, they figure out whoever owns the IP address, they look for the abuse contact for the IP address holder, and they send them an email. And so if you're running something like NeoCities on top of something like Amazon Web Services, the people that are getting the complaints about like malicious activity and stuff on your infrastructure, it's going to Amazon, it's not going to you. Which means that somebody over at Amazon has to manually go through this process of like, you know, hey, we got this report, there's like some kind of problem with this stuff. Um, and if you don't have control over that, that layer and you're not paying them enough, like they can get really pissed off and they start to threaten to kick you off their network. And um, we had this problem really early on. So initially we used DigitalOcean actually for our proxy servers. Um, and uh, there's a few other web hosts that were doing that initially too, and they still are. Uh, the difference is that um, they, they got an abuse complaint earlier. It was like a DMCA takedown request or something, but it was like a, it was like a not a valid DMCA takedown and they were ignoring it. And uh, DigitalOcean just shut all of their servers off like while they were hosting other people's sites. Because there's the context of DigitalOcean, well, well, first of all, that they own the IP addresses and like that's sort of their autonomous area and they have their own terms of service um, that you sort of have to adhere to in addition to your terms of service. So you get two terms of service that you have to adhere to, essentially. And um, the other thing is they just assume that you're running a WordPress blog. You know, like they think that if, you, if they get a report of a phishing attack, they think that you're like, that you're just, oh, this is just some WordPress blog that got hacked and we'll just take it down until he fixes his WordPress or whatever and then bring it back up. Um, but yeah, we, that was a pretty scary thing for us because we were on people's networks and we were getting complaints and our, our detection stuff wasn't very good back then and they were threatening to kick us off our network, you know. Uh, whereas when you get IP addresses and you peer with people, pretty much the only thing in their terms of service is don't spam and don't, don't do email spam and don't like DDoS stuff. And so if you're not doing, if you're not, basically don't disrupt their network. And as long as you're not disrupting their network, they won't take any of it down unless you get, they get a court order to do it from like a government. Um, so autonomy is a really important thing when you start having to deal with a lot of people like, like we do. <laughs> um, but yeah, the other thing is more restrictive services. Like, I mean, Cloudflare, for example, is, I mean, it's a great service. Don't get me wrong. I've used it before. I actually like Cloudflare. Like their service overall is wonderful. Um, but at the end of the day, it's an HTTP proxy. It's just a juiced up Nginx. And um, you know, that means you can't do things like, I mean, maybe they do WebSockets now, but like, you, know, you can't open a socket and do some, you, you can't just like, if you have a specific protocol you want to use for something, you can't use it through them. Like it's just for HTTP. Uh, and one of, the one of the groups I'm working with is, actually a lot of people in town are doing this, like the, we're working on distributed web stuff, which I'll get to in a second. Um, and you know, it doesn't, use HTTP. We're trying to sort of develop protocols that can replace HTTP for certain types of uses. And so, you know, can't do that. You don't get a socket. So yeah, yesterday was the net neutrality protest day. Um, and, you know, it's very important because what Comcast does is, you know, in a nutshell, they control the pipes and they can basically say like, hey, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll just, you know, hey, YouTube, we have our own video on demand service and it doesn't pay for transit, but we're gonna make you pay for this transit. Um, tra who pays for transit has always been a big question on the internet. Like there's, there was no actual, like it was it's sort of accidental how they ended up paying for things. It was like, we have all this infrastructure and somebody needs to pay for it and we need to figure out how to do it. And so if you're a big enough company like, um, if, like Google and you're a big enough company like, I don't know, Com or like Cloudflare, I guess would be a better example. Um, they generally just peer with each other because essentially there's like they need to access each other anyway. Like, you know, or am I doing this right? No, I'm not doing this right. I'm sorry, I'm gonna use an ISP as an example. Let's just say like, well, let's just say Comcast. I don't even know if they're evil enough where they do this or not, but um, you know, if you're a big ISP and you're, a, the, the smaller ISPs are better at this. Uh, if you're a, like a medium sized ISP, we'll just do that. And you are, and you, you go through Google a lot and Google needs to go send a lot of traffic to you, they'll just peer with each other for free. Like they'll just say, it's in our mutual best interest to do this, so we'll just do it. Um, what, what the whole net neutrality thing is about is uh, companies like Comcast saying, hey, let's, let's stop, you know, like let, instead of just peering openly with everybody, um, let's just start charging higher for specific things. Now Comcast already does this by the way, like they realize that they are the biggest ISP in the country. And so they actually charge, I mean, unless I'm mistaken, because it's actually hard to figure this out sometimes, because it's all secret. Uh, they charge uh, like almost twice as much for transit as it 
actually costs on the open market. Um, I've actually looked at services that like directly peer with Comcast and they intentionally charge more as a consequence because they have to pay Comcast more. So Comcast is already, like you think of it in the context of net neutrality, they're already basically screwing everybody over because they're charging more for transit because they know you have to, con if you want like uncongested connections to their network, you have to go through that. Um, all that they're asking for now is just the ability to sort of pick and choose like who they're going to make worse and better. That's the difference. But they're already charging more for everything, and they already can do things like fight with YouTube by just raising the general rate of all peering and, and not even just distinguishing between them. But another thing I want to keep you on the radar with is, is that you know, if these services start taking over, uh, the, if, if we start seeing IP transit companies go out of business, and we start seeing things like you know, Amazon Web Services and Google Cloud buying their own infrastructure for doing transit, and they start becoming the IP transit instead with all the sort of stuff baked on top of it, not just being like a neutral like sort of IP transit service that just gives you an internet connection. Um, that could be really bad for the internet too. And so it's something, you know, it's just something I like to point out is just like keep, a, keep, keep, keep looking at both sides of it and make sure that, you know, because there is a lot of stuff on the sort of back end where people can do bad things too. Um, and um, you know, one of those things that you know, is very interesting right now is that Google has recently um, decided that they're not, no longer in opposition to digital uh, DRM, digital rights management. Um, I was actually over in Boston a couple months ago uh, talking with Harry Halpin, who quit the W3C in protest because Tim Berners-Lee has said that he's going to, well, he did. He approved uh, uh, EME, which is this like extension for DRM and browsers. Um, and you know, it's, it's, the, it's curious to me that Google is sort of starting to go in the direction of buying all this transit, uh, in a, in, while at the same time, you know, they're doing things like saying, you know, we're, 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 we're okay with DRM now, that's not a big deal. And I talked to Harry a little bit about it, and one of the things he sort of led me into is that um, the bigger companies are a little concerned about advertising in the future. They're not sure if advertising is going to continue to be like a main revenue model for them. And so one of the things they're very interested in is getting in content distribution. Uh, and content distribution is sort of like, you know, like video on demand, you know, you know Google's already hardcore doing it with YouTube, um, you know, tw Twitch TV, stuff like that, which is now Amazon. And so part of my thought process, you know, this is at the conspiracy stage at this level because I have no actual evidence. But, you know, I feel like one of the reasons why they charge a very different rate for bandwidth than First of all, they actually pay for it, and second of all, what the market actually asks for it is simply because they don't want to turn into what Comcast did, which is sort of like became the utility platform for their competitors. Um, and, and so that, that's just sort of like, you know, you, you can't do a streaming media service on Amazon with those rates because they'll just blow you out of the water with theirs because they don't have to pay for it. Um, so anyway, just something to keep in mind, <laughs> you know, like the, the, this could be a thing. So uh, I've hopefully convinced you that there's at least something wrong with the bandwidth system here. Um, I want to give you some random solutions uh, that I've like sort of found while trying to figure out how to make NeoCities work at all. Um, OV the companies like OVH and Hetzner, and they, they sort of like these sort of budget server rental services, um, they generally don't charge, they either give you a ton of bandwidth like included or they just don't really, they just don't meter it and they just don't care. Um, if you shoved enough transit through it, I'm sure they'd get pissed off at you at some point. But for the most part, you know they over provision, or they over provision all the servers. Most people don't actually use that transit, and they're fine as long as they have a big enough pipe. Um, I've actually uh, NeoCities ran on OVH for I want to say three years, and we never had a downtime associated with OVH. Um, the only time we had a downtime was when Comcast cut a cable in California. Actually, uh, it was only for people in California, which I learned because Substack told me. <laughs> um, VPS services tend to be better. Uh, Vulture is actually what we use for our proxy network right now. They let us actually run, they, they let us connect to their BGP servers. We actually run an Anycast network through them. And they give you like a couple terabytes per instance included, and then they charge uh, a cent per gigabyte. So that's where that cent comes from. Um, a cent is closer to like where I'd expect the market rate to be for like a higher level like cloud service like that. Um, you know, if, if Amazon lowered their rates to a cent per gigabyte, I would not have a convers I would not be having this talk anymore. Like we'd be done. Um, DigitalOcean is similar. I think they charge two cents. Um, you know, Linode I think is another thing. The, again, two cents or something. Um, 
Voxility is sort of an interesting hybrid. Like they, you actually, they are, you, they're kind of like a colo, like you sort of send servers there or order servers from them. Uh, and they charge you a little bit more for a dedicated server than you'd ever want to pay for it. But what they do in return is for that increased cost, which is how they're really getting paid, uh, they charge you more or less the market rates for transit. It's, it's a little higher than transit, but it's a little more premium because they, I think they actually do peering with Comcast and stuff. So you get a little bit in exchange for that. I mean, it's like, you know, th that to me is, I know it's premium because I know I, they've actually described to me the peering agreements and stuff. So I actually understand how, why it's premium, you know, like, whereas it's just a black box everywhere else. Um, and they give you good controls over stuff, which is nice. Uh, renting racks and data centers, this is sort of the way, if you really want to get into really high level bandwidth stuff, this is what you do. Uh, you rent racks and data centers and then they don't even give you an internet connection usually. Uh, you, you get the location and then what you do is you buy transit from IP transit companies uh, like Cogent and NTT and Hurricane Electric and Level 3 and GTT and uh, there's like a there's like a hundred <laughs> you know I don't, I'm not gonna I don't remember all of them but um, I've generally had good you know the, if you Google for them on the internet people you know try to figure out which one's better than the other one you get a bunch of people complaining that like you know had to deal with some random issue sometime but you know for the most part I've never had a problem with transit providers they're usually pretty reliable actually um, fun tip <laughs> if you're looking for um, you know if you don't want to get into like BGP and running your own IP addresses and stuff and you want to know where you can just like grind like just tons and tons of traffic and you know maybe it having it be a little bit like you know like if you have like some abuse reports and complaints and stuff having them be a little more lenient about it um, I've actually found some pretty good results from just like trace routing for adult entertainment sites um, because they've obviously had this problem like a billion times over they probably get like hundreds of complaints a day on some of the biggest sites I mean whether they're legitimate or not um, and um, the, one of the interesting things you learn about this when you start, because I did, I just like, I just typed in, you know, adult entertainment or something, and I just trace routed like the first 20 hits on Google, and they all actually, pretty much all of it comes from Amsterdam. Like they don't even use CDNs, it just all comes from Amsterdam, and like goes ships directly from Amsterdam to your house. Like, um, and, I, and I, I'm, I'm imagining there's some like political reasons for that. Like, you know, the Netherlands has always been a very sort of long-standing, like tolerant, Society, society on like social cultural issues or whatever, whereas like that kind of stuff is still even today, even though it's like culturally a little more like lenient, like there's still some like legal gray areas with a lot of this stuff. Um, but yeah, I found actually a great company that uh, over in Amsterdam that that will basically give you like a unmetered connection for 200 bucks a month, and you just put a server on it and go crazy. And they don't care. <laughs> um, I talked about BGP really quick. If you really want to get hardcore and you really want to do a ton of transit, uh, you're going to have to get into BGP. Um, I do not say this lightly, it is a nightmare. It is the single craziest thing I've ever done in my life is learn how this works. Uh, BGP is sort of for the Gort-Berg Gateway Protocol. Um, it's the way that you take IP addresses and you peer with like transit providers and then like you can do all kinds of crazy stuff. Like you can route to you know, traffic certain ways, uh, you can set rules for it. You can um, try to route like traffic that's like coming from like regional areas to regional locations. Um, you can actually, like they use these things called BGB communities and you can actually control where the traffic goes. Like I can actually, like it's amazing to me that they even let me do this, but like I can, when I use NTT, we use NTT for most of our transit right now because they're amazing. Um, when you send them a community, you're telling their router to move your, to, like all over their net, the routers of their network to like move their traffic differently, which is just insane to me that they let me do that, but they do. Um, and you can, yeah, that's how, if you want to get really, really cheap and really, really bulk bandwidth, that's how you do it. Um, so another thing that might be happening in the future, instead of just like IP transit dying and being replaced by like three companies is the distributed web. How am I doing on time? Sorry. Oh God, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I'm almost done. I've only two slides. So. You know, instead of like this dark future of like two giant centralized companies or whatever running everything, um, one of the things that's really interesting right now, and I'm, I'm sure you guys have heard about this because maybe Max is going to talk on it, but this, well, just this idea of like this notion of like distributed uh, systems, distributed storage, just, uh, you know, distributed networking, that sort of stuff. The distributed web is the thing that I'm very interested in. They call it the decentralized web, a lot of people. I actually like prefer to call it the distributed web. I think that sort of is more 
you know, it's more descriptive of what it actually is. To me, the internet is already centralized, and like the flaws in that process are what are creating the, the problem where it's becoming more centralized. And so distributed is a sort of a nice, clean way to describe a new system. Um, it's essentially, uh, instead of looking for locate the instead of asking locations for data, it's like you ask an entire network for the data using a hash. And what you get as, from that as a consequence is that you can download essentially data from anybody. Uh, we've already, you know, this isn't a theoretical concept. If you use BitTorrent before, you've already done this um, many, many times over. Um, but the idea is to take the concept of BitTorrent and apply it to uh, a, a new protocol that would work well for the web so that we could conceivably replace HTTP with it in the future for a lot of things. Maybe not everything, but like a lot of things. Um, and if we had that, you know, you know, and, and a way to incentivize that so that individuals were like helping to distribute this content, you know, it would almost eliminate the concept of a CDN because essentially, instead of having like these sort of edge CDNs and data centers, like in regional areas, you could have your CDN consist of like hundreds of thousands of people all over the world just like running their computer at their house, like helping to, to sort of distribute this content inside Comcast's network or whatever ISP they're in, in such a way that like we don't even have you know, we don't even have this, you, there's no concept of net neutrality anymore because if they can't control the border, you know, if the data is inside their border, they can't do things like charge for peering or whatever to get rid of competitors because it's there, you know, it's, it's like inside their network. Um, so I'm very, you know, I'm very, this is like my, this is my, this is my white whale right now. I, I really want this to happen. Um, and then Filecoin is just uh, an attempt, uh, a a, a, an attempt of one specific group to incentivize that so that people actually do it instead of it just being this like theoretical thing that nobody ever does. Um, and that's part of uh, Protocol Labs, which is working on the IPFS stuff. And that's what I've been doing a lot of work with on like an experimental level. So um, anyway, I won't, uh, you know, that's, that, there's some news on that coming in a couple of weeks and it'll be interesting. So. Um, that's it, I'm done. Thanks. Questions? questions? Yeah. Yeah, I was just wondering about this. If you were thinking about the decentralized money. Oh, yeah. I'm going to run it. I, for, the, uh, for the camera so we can get it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So, yeah, I was wondering when you were talking about the uh, decentralized web, when uh, where people can have like parts of files distributed, so you don't have to go through a, through a centralized point. Uh, why hasn't that happened yet? Because we have torrents since like ten years ago or something like that. So, what's your take on that? Why it hasn't happened? Hi. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, why? I think it's a, a combination of things. Um, first of all, it's um, the the idea of like using cryptocurrencies to sort of incentivize. It's kind of a new thing. Um, you know, really over only in the last I'm gonna say less than three or four years has people really started to think about that. Um, this sort of way of like how do you how do you incentivize distributed things? Um, and so you know, there's a lot of experimentation going on there. There will be a lot of really successful, really interesting things. There will be a lot of like you know horrible tire fires. Uh, don't, you know, but I, I think that that is, you know, if we can get that system to work, then I think that will do really well um, for sort of incentivizing this. Because this is the problem with distributed systems is that it's like we make these systems and they're really neat, but then like nobody ever uses them. That's sort of like, it's like a thing where like just, a, you know, whenever I've used a distributed thing before, like it's, it's usually just like me and like 300 people that have ever like used it. And, and, and so it becomes very difficult to sort of, you know, how do you, how do you push something to the mainstream, you know? Another thing with BitTorrent is that the BitTorrent network, while quite powerful at this point and very good at like sort of distributing uh, a lot, uh, like sort of big chunks of data, uh, it's not really built with the context of like a rapid response, right? When you load a torrent, it doesn't really matter if it takes a couple minutes for it to initialize to start downloading it or whatever, because you know it's a Linux ISO, and you know if it takes like 30 seconds to connect it, and then like takes another you know 30 seconds to really ramp up, it's not really that big of a deal. Uh, whereas with the web, if you have to wait like a minute and a half to load a web page, you're going to throw your laptop across the room. And so part of the process is like figuring out how to, you know, speed it up so that it sort of is able to be competitive with things like HTTP. Um, yeah. 
Um, is anyone talking about using um, blockchain technology, for example, um, and some of the cryptocurrency technology for getting beyond um, monetary interactions into stuff like authentication um, and um, identity verica verification and so forth? Oh yeah, yeah just like on, on like a yeah. Well, on a general on a general level, um, there's been a lot of like. That, so that, that, that if you if you're looking for something to fun to dig through tonight, uh, Google for Web of Trust. Uh, that is sort of the, the that area of where things are starting to get interesting with like identification and like you know uh, Keybase does a really good example, a uh, really good ex inter implementation of this, where they sort of like use like this is my uh, Twitter account, this is my Facebook account, this is my website, and then they verify all these things, and it creates a sort of chain of events that links all of this to your PGP key. Uh, at least it used to. Uh, they're like building a chat app or something now. I don't even know, but like I haven't used it in a while. Um, I, I also think I lost my PGP. I gotta deal with that still. <laughs> um, I don't know how. Anyway, um, but in terms of like uh, the authentication of the content itself, like served through a distributed web system, uh, there's two basic types of data. There's immutable data, which is just data that doesn't change, right? So if you take a uh, text file and you hash it, and then that's, that, that hash represents that file. You know, that's, that's the, always gonna represent that file, and you can just use that hash to always retrieve it, and you don't care if it changes or not. Um, there's also this concept of mutable data uh, on a distributed web, which is sort of like, you use a private key to sign, uh, um, the sign the, that, that you have, to essentially s assign that data and say that they like, claim it for say like this is this if you were looking for my thing use the public key derived from this private key and you will find it uh, you will be able to look up the ha the immutable so it's like the immutable hash is then signed essentially by this private key and then you get mutability and you can do things like changes to websites which you know is pretty important because I, I think the Internet Archive figured out that websites change every like five seconds or something like that <laughs> on average I don't remember but yeah. Glad I wore my running shoes. Um, kind of related to the last question, actually. Um, you were talking about IPFS and Filecoin, um, and um, I know nothing about what I'm talking about, but I'm curious if you've looked into, like, for example, name services built on top of Ethereum. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, I. I um, I was very early. I, I was a very early adopter of Namecoin. Actually, I actually have some Namecoin. Um, I, I've, I think I, you know, I've registered actually NeoCities.bit. Is I, I'm pretty sure I own that. Um, and um, I, I really like the idea. I mean, I did a talk a little while ago. So like, I, I want to talk about bandwidth here, but I did a talk a while ago that was sort of like the completely distributed web is what I called it. And essentially, it was this idea of, you know, how do I take how do I build and you know how do I build something that actually is completely you know, because when you throw a hash for example on the DNS system we use today and you then plug that into a distributed web model well it is centralized in one part right because somebody the, the DNS stuff is centralized essentially um, but when you take something like a distributed naming system uh, that's based on something like a you know a cryptocurrency like Namecoin for example. Um, then it, you get a system that is in fact completely distributed. Like you can use your key to control the entire thing. And there is no, there's no ICANN, there's no Aaron, there's none of this, you know, like it's just you and that site and it's completely distributed. And uh, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful idea. It's very magical, you know, I mean, it's this idea of like, if we can make this work, then, you know, we don't need organizational structures to do this stuff anymore, which is really crazy. Um, now, to answer your question specifically about Ethereum, one of the problems with distributed naming services is, again, it goes back to my earlier thing where it's sort of like there's, like, you know, there's several implementations and then there's 100 people, you know? And so Namecoin was a thing for a while and it kind of looked like, and then it sort of died off for some reason. And then um, there's, a, I think there's another company that's doing something related to that with Ethereum. And then there's like another company doing something like, you know, there's like four implementations off of Ethereum now. And it's, again, it's just this problem of like, you know, there's, there's a few too many cooks in the kitchen sometimes in the space because it is a really interesting area. And, um, 
you know, it's, it's, it, I, I can't, it's one of those things where I can't really use any of them because none of them are sort of becoming the standard. And so it's, again, very frustrating tragedy of the common situation where it's sort of like nothing ever wins because there's like six of them or whatever, you know. But um, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm hoping at some point something will stabilize a little bit and somebody will start using one of them and then I can kind of be like, okay, we'll use this one. But there's really no, there's really no strong difference between all of them. They're more or less doing the same thing, you know. So... Yeah, DNS is the name. Domain names are fundamentally a name problem. You know, if humans could memorize 128 bits, uh, we would never, ha we wouldn't have to have DNS at all. Like we, we could actually because there would just be enough, you know, names or whatever. But of course, domains have are, are like, you know, they're like property in that they're valuable. You know, like cars.com is a very valuable domain. Uh, I've never actually been to it, but I'm just assuming it's valuable, right? Because it's like it's very it makes makes sense. <laughs> Um, and, and just that constraint on our ability to memorize long things is just sort of the reason that that becomes a property. Um, and, and so there's always going to be a, this is the one thing I will say about DNS stuff because a lot of people are really, they get really confused. But it's like, why, why do you have to pay for it? Why does it have to be currency based? Um, because it is intrinsically property. Domain names are property. And it's a finite resource and that finite resource is what gives it a value. And so it has to be a cryptocurrency solution uh, in that in a distributed sense because there's just again if you if you make it free everyone just, some one guy's just going to write a Python like a JavaScript a Node script that just registers all the domain on the planet and they'll just own all of them and, and we'll go to his website. Yeah. Thank you. That was awesome.